Hello, and welcome to the Midwestern Geek and Cali podcast. I'm your host, Dan Stafford, podcasting from 42 Tardis Way in beautiful Temecula, California, which is summer's winter home. On this podcast, we'll talk about science, technology, science fiction, the paranormal, local entrepreneurship, regional entrepreneurship, occasionally politics, uh, poetry, especially sci-fi poetry, and all other things geek. So get ready for the deep stuff, because we're about to take a dive into the cosmos. Good afternoon. This is your host, Dan Stafford, with the Midwestern Geek and Cali podcast slash YouTube channel slash videocast. And I have a guest in the studio with me here, 42 Tardis Way, here in Temecula, California, a lovely summer's winter home. And I spun that all around this time. <laughs> My guest today is Brian Karen. He's a local author uh, that does mainly sci-fi, and we're going to get into a little bit of what his work is all about. All right. Sounds good to me. All right. Uh, Brian, so let's give the readers a little bit of your backstory. What kind of a background do you have? In writing? Uh, so my background in writing stems pretty far back uh, to where, you know, when I was a young kid, I always loved writing. The uh, Some of the favorite classes in school were English classes and writing classes and things like that. Um, you know, a teacher would assign something for the class, the, you know, a one-page assignment or whatever, and I would go back and, and come, come back to the school with five seven pages <laughs> instead well everybody else had one you know that kind of thing so i always enjoyed it and i always you know loved you know watching television go into movies and things like that and so that that the whole process of, of coming up with stories and everything was was really big for me and then so i went to a couple of schools before really get diving in to after high school, went to film school, went to art school and all this type of stuff before I really focused in on getting uh, the creative writing side of everything. And then so back in 2000, 1999 actually, uh, to 2001, I went to UC Riverside to get my bachelor's degree in creative writing uh, with a focus in fiction and screenwriting, uh, which I've done both of. I've got now five published novels um, that can be found on Amazon uh, or in your local bookstore if you ask for them. And any type of ebook, Kindle, Nook, uh, iBooks, all of those, you can find all of my books on there. And one of my books this past February was just uh, published as an audio book as well. So sweet. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, that, that was <laughs> cool. Yeah, Audible, I'm assuming. Uh, you can get it on Audible, iTunes, um, or Google Play. One. I think there's, yeah, I think maybe Google Play too. But yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much anywhere you get, you can find audiobooks. It should be available. Nice. Okay, so you said you went to uh, film school, and what was the other one? Uh, art school. Art school. And it, can you outline a little bit what the courses were that you took there? So. For the, for the film school, I didn't last very long. Personal reasons came up. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I took some, you know, cinematography courses and, and editing courses and things like that before I left. Um, it only lasted about six months, about a semester for that. For the art school, it was mainly, you know, art history, drawing, painting, all that type of stuff. Um, nice. Prior to nice. going into... At that school, I had a, actually a minor in creative writing, which is where I found out about uh, UC Riverside, because one of the books that we had for the course was written by a professor at UCR. So, nice. so that's kind of what drove me to look in more into that and then really get that transfer started. And then after I finished UCR, I went back to school, a um, place called Coleman College. Uh, they had a satellite campus in San Marcos 
where I went back to go and get my credentials in, in graphic design and learn Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, web design, and all that stuff. So. Yeah, very nice. I was going to get into the work background a little bit, too, <laughs> because I think that probably plays into, you know, your total life experience always is going to inform and support your writing. Right. So I wanted to get into that a little bit, too. So let's talk about what you've done for work mm -hmm. a little bit. So what I do for work now or kind of my history and get, get, let's give a history and then maybe a little bit of what you do now okay. when you're not you're not being a writer cool so yeah so when i after once i went back to school for the graphic design side i got mm -hmm. a job at a film school that taught kids and adults acting and directing and all the all that stuff and so while i was working there um, i got a position there as a graphic designer but when I wasn't busy or when I wasn't doing work, I was crashing courses in, in film. And that's where I learned mainly how to edit, you know, mostly in Final Cut Pro at that point in time. Got together with a lot of filmmakers there to start filmmaking and, and doing films with them. Got hooked up with a group in Fallbrook that also did films and started working a lot of film work with them. And that's kind of how I dived into the filmmaking side after leaving that other place, you know, five or six or years earlier, started directing and editing and, and producing and, and doing that with my own stuff, writing uh, my own films on that with them. One of those films actually got a, uh, a Best Screenplay Award at a festival in Florida, and a it was a runner-up second place for Best Short Film at a uh, film festival at Raleigh Studios in Los Angeles there. That was really cool. I like that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, but uh, as far as the other work side, while I was doing all that, the film stuff, <laughs> I was working for a company down in Mira Mesa doing, it was called Marcoa Publishing, and we did guidebooks for military bases. And so I was working as a Started there as a scrubber or a pre-press analyst, which means, you know, I took in all the advertisers' artwork and made sure it was good for print. And then worked my way up over eight years to senior graphic designer. And, you know, basically, you know, lasted through. This was, you know, right right around 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I lasted through three major cuts in employees during that time when the economy took a tank. <laughs> oh, is that a familiar tale? I went through very similar things in right. telecommunications between 2002 and 2014. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so I lasted, became a senior designer, and then um, circumstances led me to leave there. And I figured, you know, I have all this knowledge and, and history and writing in filmmaking and in design. So I decided to pull them all together to create my business that I do now that, uh, that I've been building for the last four and a half years now. So Perfect. So we're going to get into that in a minute, but I have to make a comment here. Sure. There's no moss under your feet, is there? <laughs> no moss, huh? In other words, you don't sit still much. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I'm always moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we have that in common. Uh, that's actually a good thing, though. Leads for a full life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, right. I can't. I can't sit still. I can't stand still. <laughs> it's just, just me. Yeah. No, that's cool. So, um, let's go ahead and get into uh, your current business. We'll we'll get into the books in a little bit because I'm going to want to dive into those too sure. a bit, but sure. let's get into your current business and, and what are you doing to keep the paychecks rolling in until the books take off? Right. So right now, most of my clients come from networking. I am an ambassador with the uh, Murrieta Wildemar Chamber of Commerce and I participate in a BNI group as well, and right now those two have have really helped me, not only grow the business and, and really find clients, but to break me out of my shell a little bit. I, I'm more of an introvert for sure. Um, mm. Most creatives are. <laughs> you know, we like to sit in front of our computers and do the work. 
<laughs> you know? Right. I'm sure you're like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Without um, interruption and distraction. <laughs> yes, I understand. But yeah, if I hadn't have, have joined those two, I don't know if I if my business would have taken off too fast or, or as fast as it has been. But yeah, this, this past year has been really good for me. And it, yeah, I just keep getting out there and keep doing stuff and trying to find, you know, just just working my way networking and all that good stuff so yeah very very cool all right so let's talk about the books you have now a total of five published and the sixth one in the works is sixth it? one in the works i'm currently on my second draft uh 50 pages or so into my second draft of the of the sixth book so if everything goes as planned i should have that released either in december or early january okay good something to look forward to so let's go into them book by book and lead in with the title and then give me an idea so, so should we go let's see should we go by order of publication or by order of how i wrote them because <laughs> there's a little bit of a difference in in how i wrote them and how i published them I think what makes the most sense to you as the writer, okay. I, I think I would roll with that because you have more insight into what those are about and cool. how they relate to each other, if at all, than anyone else on the planet. Right. So. <laughs> that works for me. Yeah, because I can always backtrack and, and talk about some earlier stuff as I'm going forward because, um, you know, just to fill in some of the details and some of the, the backstories on some of them. Okay, uh, but I think doing it publication-wise is the easiest way to talk about them. Okay, all right. Um, because it it goes into um, the actual self-publishing side as well, in that regard. So that would work. So you just want me to start with that first book? Yeah, just roll into the first book. Uh, what's the title and what's the premise, and then? So the first book that I self-published was Year of the Songbird. It is a dystopian novel um, set um, just after, about 26 years after World War III. And it's about a this uh, utopian kind of environment that got set up during World War III to kind of rid the world of bias and prejudice and racism and all that, those bad you know, negative connotations and raise children without the knowledge of those things. Uh, Interesting. And the main character uh, is named Madeline, and she is blind. And when she turns 16, someone from the outside of this utopia comes stumbling in, and she becomes really fascinated with this person because he's lived his entire life outside in the world you know in the world war three ravished world so she becomes fascinated by him and he find when he finds out that she's blind he tells her that he has a way of curing her blindness but she has to go with him to make that happen so the book is more about her and how she deals with finding out about all of this stuff that she never knew about about racism about um all of this you know this very bad stuff and it's kind of like a whole uh nature nurture type thing going on there mm -hmm, about how mm -hmm. much you know yes we we learn by nature but we also learn by being nurtured and by absorbing what our outside influences are so that's kind of what that book is about and that one came about when i saw kind of that was published in 2012 and it was just a, a way for me to express how I was feeling at the time about where I saw the world going. If we keep going the same way direction that we're currently in, <laughs> it's still very relevant today <laughs> as it was back then. <laughs> it kind of sounds like it, yeah. And that one came really quick to me. That one was written really fast. It was written within a year. And at that same time when I was writing that book, I found out, I started to research how I could get the book out there and I learned about Amazon's publishing arm 
which was CreateSpace, and started you know researching more of that and found out that I could definitely go in there and do that. That in their ebook uh, KDP, which is Kindle Direct Publishing, started researching that as well and found out that yeah this would be a really good way for me to get my work out there without having to go with a traditional publisher which that door is difficult to break down right exactly just like the movie business <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so yeah so once i found out i could do that it was like great just get this book out there at that same time i was publishing that one my next book the title of that is Jaxaracala the search and that is J-A-X-X-A-R-A-K-A-L-A -A -A -A. <laughs> for anybody who does not know how to spell it and wants to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um. we might, we might, <laughs> I might be referring to that when I'm doing the show notes on this later. <laughs> right. There you go, see. That book is a, is a space opera. It's a sci-fi book, you know, pure sci-fi, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek style book about a guy that builds a, a spaceship to go and try to find his wife who he believes was abducted by aliens and as he goes and he tests the hyperdrive it starts to malfunction and they get sent way out to who knows where and get picked up by a team of uh, space pirates basically who kind of join them in searching for his wife in that regard so that was that book but that book was actually written first it was one of my first novels that i wrote and the reason it was was because it was the thesis for my creative writing degree in college uh, uh, the way that the, makes sense. the way the class worked was either you wrote i believe it was four short stories or 100 pages of a novel and so i decided you know what I've got this grand idea because this was the first book in a four-part series that I had planned. So I said, you know what, let's get started on that book. And so I wrote that first 100 pages for my thesis at UCR, finished it up, and I did get that one published by a, a kind of a vanity press that I was not happy with. At the same time that I was publishing Year of the Songbird, I kind of looked at my contracts and everything and found out that that book... The contract was up for that book um, in the summer of that same year of 2012 to where I would get my rights back for the book. So I could then publish that one through the same system, you know, redo the cover, go back in, re-edit, rewrite some of the scenes, get it, get it polished up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I did did all that, you know, with within a few months after I published Year of the Songbird, I started writing on that one to get it ready so that when I got those rights back, I could publish right away. So that happened in the summer of 2012. And then that same year, was it 2012? No, this was 2013. Was it 2013? I don't know. It's 2012 or 2013. One of those two. The third book was actually published that November. So I had basically three books published in the same year because of the way it fell. The third book is In the Light of the Eclipse. And that one is a young adult novel about a, a community, you know, a land, a community, kind of like Hunger Games or, you know, divergent type of okay you know sanctum but in my book there's a an eclipse that happens every 17 years and with this eclipse when the eclipse happens it takes the life of anybody who's over the age of 17. so the longest you could live in this community is 34 years basically if you were born right after the eclipse or a year after the youngest you could be is 18. So if you hit 18, you were, and that eclipse came, that was it. You're toast. So the story is about during the eclipse, there's always a child born as the eclipse is happening. So the story is about the girl that was born during the last eclipse and her trying to save her best friend who just turned 18 two weeks before the eclipse. So it's the story of her trying to figure out how to stop the eclipse from taking everyone's life basically and 
that one has a fun background as well. So every every Christmas Eve, uh, me and my, my family goes up to my aunt's house and we have a Christmas Eve get together. Mm -hmm. And during that time, there was a bunch of kids, you know, that come, you know, my cousin and whatnot. And I told them one year that I was a writer and they didn't believe me. You know, they, they joked about it and they, you know, oh, you're not a writer, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, okay, well, you tell me what you want me to write and I'll write you a novel or I'll write, I'll write it for you. So they, they gave me kind of the bare bones, kind of what they wanted to see. And I took it and expanded on it. And that was what came out in the light of the eclipse is what came out of that. Oh, that's an interesting way to come up with it. I, you know, it's those challenge things. I do a lot right. of online poetry, mm -hmm. I, a lot of nice. online poetry for a long time, and a lot of stuff comes out of collaboration yeah. and you know challenges and that kind of stuff. I like the old school poetry boards that we used to have in the 90s. There's still a couple of them around. Yeah, yeah. I was never really big on poetry. Uh, that was never my forte. I was always the more the novel person. Like I try to, I try to write short stories even sometimes and can't do it because it's too short. I need I, more. <laughs> I was, uh, I have a couple of ideas for novels, but I, I just never. I seem to be like all, almost always working nonstop and never really have the time to write right. anything of length. And poetry is fun because you can get a concept down in like fifteen minutes. Right. You know, so, yeah. I mean, it's kind of the writer's easy way out in a way. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. But it, it, this isn't about me, so <laughs> let's move back on. Uh, so so uh, yeah. what about the third book? So that so that was the third book. In right, the Light of the right, right. And yeah. those, again, those three, the, the Year of the Songbird, the reason I got the years confused is because the, the Kindle version came out in 2012. The print version came out in 2013. And then the other two books followed in 2013. The fourth book came out in 2015, and that was book two of Jock Suricala, which is called Memoirs of Caledria. I dare you to try to find that type, <laughs> the, 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 the spelling on that. Um, okay. Uh, so what happens in that one is, you know, it's just a continuation of the first book, of course. So I can't really go into it until you've read the first one. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, that one came out in 2015. And then my most recent book, which came out in 2016, which means I need to get on this book. I need to get these published, man. It's too long. <laughs> <laughs> I need to come up with at least one every year right now. So the, the last book was 2016. It's called The Spirit Of. And that one is what I call a religious sci-fi because I combine science fiction with the Bible and spirituality uh, in, in a way. So that one is about a team of archaeologists who discover the location of Atlantis. And as they go out to Atlantis to kind of excavate it, they learn that it has a lot more connection to the genesis of the Bible than anyone has ever thought before. So, Interesting. And that one is my longest book. That one is 750 pages. That was one of those books that the writers really love because it just flowed. Yeah. It was one of those that, you know, once I started writing, I figured I'd write about, it was based on the story and kind of the synopsis I had for it. I was figuring it would run about 450 pages. And when the first draft was finished, it ran almost a thousand pages, double spaced. Wow. <laughs> in Word document double-spaced thousand pages that's so a pretty large file about size 250,000 words yeah um, that, that makes for a nice big file <laughs> yeah for sure. Sl slow to open <laughs> <laughs> now this is my inner computer right. geek coming out <laughs> yes, exactly that was actually the second book i wrote so that was actually one that i wrote right after i finished jock Suricala, the first book you know, once I got that one, you know, did a few revisions on it. That was I tried to sell it to, you know, get it to some traditional publishers. No one was biting, whatnot. So I kind of let that one just sit on the shelf, collect dust for a while, until I found out about this self-publishing thing. Yeah. And then once once I got those three books done, and 
you know, I needed to get that second book written of Jockster College because of the ones that had read it before I really wanted that sequel. So I had to get that one done. But once that was finished, it was like, okay, it's time to go back and, and reopen this other book up to see, you know, to get that one done. Got it in there again, redid the entire thing. A lot of that, it did need a lot of work. Um, so I understand why nobody was accepting it <laughs> at the publishing houses because it did need a, it need, did need a, quite a bit of work. Um, I was able to to pare it down to the essentials, to, to, and, right? To, to, yeah. to really cut it and really fine tune it and get it so that it wasn't, you know, it dropped in the word document. It dropped to probably about 850 pages from a thousand. Um, well, that's a significant reduction. So when yeah, it, when it went into the actual layout, it was 750. Right. I'm um, assuming part of that process was also continuity check and that type of continuity thing. Continuity check, but mostly just cleaning it up and, and, and getting rid of all the superfluous stuff that was in it that I didn't need. Um, it was still good, mind you. <laughs> you know, it was the book was still really good. It just it was it just had a lot of stuff that didn't need to be there. Yeah. Uh, so and then that one. So once I finished that one up. You know, I got that one done and got that one out there. And then I started, once that one was published, that's when I started trying to figure out what I was going to do next. <laughs> and that's where I came, it got started my, my next one, um, which has taken longer to do partially because of work-related um, necessities. Get busy. Having to, having to do all the networking, building a business, and all that good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it takes it takes its toll sometimes, um, well, especially when you're doing creative stuff as a job. Sometimes you don't want to do the creative stuff when you're not working for your clients and whatnot, because you got to refresh the brain, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then again, there's also the times when you're in it. And you're deep in it, and you don't want to get knocked out of it to go actually do the stuff that brings in a paycheck. <laughs> right. <laughs> that too. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because when you're on a roll, it's hard to get off the roll until it's it's over with. Right. Yeah. So I completely understand. All right. So you got a teaser on the on the sixth book that's in the works. Got a title yet, or a working title? I have the working title is Threads. Okay. Um, and all I can say about that right now is that it's uh, a little bit sci-fi, a little bit fantasy, a little bit metafiction. Okay, and you're making me think of Anne McCaffrey right now. Am I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking more. Um, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Um, Amy Bender. If you haven't read Amy Bender, read some of her short stories. And you'll kind of get the feel of what I'm going for. I in this think new book. I, I, the name is familiar, and I can't place a story, but the name is familiar. Yeah, we did a class on her in, in yeah, UCR, and I just loved her style and the way she wrote. And so I did a couple of my own short stories based on her style. You know, it's kind of kind of how we were cast to kind of write in the style of one of the authors we were being taught and that was i did a couple of short stories in her style i actually sent one i had the professor actually let you know sent one of the stories to her <laughs> and got a nice response from her too sweet that was cool sweet okay so so let's jump back off the books for a minute and, and let's talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of what your current business is because i'm going to want to actually you know like let you plug it on here Okay. too so I, because i mean i i want to see you getting the paycheck so that you can <laughs> so that afford to do the creative work right so yeah I can afford to do the writing yeah so that the writing will eventually be the paycheck <laughs> <laughs> well exactly and that so that when i get back to a point where i can be the hard-ass reader that i used to be right. i i can you know <laughs> actually on. grab some of these and you know i, I mean it'd be fun right. to read works by a guy that i know that's a, a local author that would be a lot of fun for me right. yeah. and i'm I'm a sci-fi geek, heavy-duty reader from way back, and then all of a sudden I started working like night shift and 60-hour weeks and two jobs, and 
you know, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden my reading time went down to about a thimble full a year. And in in my working time went to like, like a full gas tank. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, the drill, but yeah. um, yeah, So let's get into what you're actually doing now for a business. You talked a little bit about how you got there to a business, but you didn't really talk about what it was, what you're actually doing. So lay that out for us. So what I actually do is the creative side. What I tout myself as at the networking meetings and everything is the creative genius for all of your graphic design, writing, and videography needs. So what that entails is that you know I can do. Um, I, I specialize in print design. So any anything from you know your your logos or your business cards or your marketing materials. I did an ad for you um, at one point. In yes, time you did, well. and I still use that. Nice, good to hear. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and you know layout design, uh, magazines, catalogs, newsletters, anything that that can and, and will be printed. That's my my main source of income because it's what most people need right away. The other side, of course, is the writing and the video side. When I get the writing is is mostly ad copy, uh, website content. I do blogs. I do a blog right now for somebody, and, and so that's something I can do as well. I know some uh, website owners that should be listening <laughs> up right now. I'm just saying. I'm structure, and this guy is content. Just saying. Right. There you go. <laughs> Um, and then on the video side, you know, you were talking, you know, promotional videos and white, you know, green screen videos or any type of video that you want to use to get your business, you know, try and get more Mm -hmm. business because video is one of the top things that people look for nowadays because they want to see something. They want to watch something. They don't want to read content. They don't want to, or for the most part, you know, if they can watch a video over reading a page of content they're going to watch the video yeah um, so. yeah mo- most people are not readers like us right yeah so you know if you if it needs to be filmed if it needs to be written if it needs to be designed i can make it happen and this includes illustration i'm, I'm really good with illustrator and, and you know whether it be cartoon character or a more kind of photorealistic i can do both ends of the spectrum on that i also do uh, font design now um, I've started getting into that so if you need your own custom font <laughs> I can sweet that that's fun for you. it's expensive though because it takes a long oh time yeah to design a font. <laughs> I, I looked at trying to do a custom font one time and I'm like there's a lot of work there <laughs> especially if you want you know a bold font an italic font and you want you want all these different layers to it right and underline not, right. yeah that's yeah. not just you know doing, yeah doing some minor tweaks that's actually creating you know four or five different fonts which is when you know when you go buy a font you know you, you, it can get really expensive when you start buying the italic version and the bold version and all this other stuff with it. yeah, yeah. Um, and I al- have also started getting in the last couple of years doing motion graphics as well so a lot of after effects work and, and that stuff just to, to complement the video work that I've been doing um, and the editing side of everything so all of that encompassing into a one one man show here you know covering it all instead of the basic concept behind why i started it was instead of having someone like yourself or like your listeners going to three different places to get their video done to get their writing done to get their graphic design done now they can come to one place and get it all done by the same person so that it's consistent so that it's got the same feel to it and it's always going to be that brand is going to stay true that word you. that applies to a long novel continuity exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> continuity yeah. and consistency yeah yeah um, which is important in branding yeah that's yeah, very important in branding yeah excellent yeah just uh fyi for my readers as a side gig um one of one of my side gigs i do com- you know computers i'm more on the software end of computers but I also do WordPress custom websites, but I'm more into the structure and teaching the client how to 
do like updates and you know maintain the website and where brian's going is the hard part the content Content. what are you going to say on that thing Right. What are you going to display on that thing? Right. And that, how is it going to look? <laughs> I, I know a lot of people that have a website up there, and it just pretty much just sits because they have no idea what they really want to say. Right. And, yeah, and that's and a it, and it, and As far as websites go, one of the biggest things people don't get in in building the website, you know, once it's up, they think it's done, which it's no. not. No. You know, you have to consistently update it. You have to continue to make sure that everything works good, make sure everything continues to work right, make sure all the plugins and everything that are supporting the website are up to date and working correctly. <laughs> but yeah. mostly, you, you you know, you need to continually update the website content. with new content. It needs to be videos, new content. New text, new pictures, sure. new everything. To make sure that Google is continuously knowing that the site is live. You're, and still you're almost <laughs> pulling the words out from between my teeth because I'm about to say here is that if you let a website sit there and get stale and stagnant, what happens is, is Google will drop you like a 17th century novel in a dustbin. Go find the musty old book. <laughs> Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Google wants new, hot, fresh, new. Yeah, right. I mean, cook daily. Yeah, well, most of us can't do that kind of right. content generation, where, but you know, weekly or or biweekly. Yeah, which is what you do is good. You know, showing them how to do it is always a step forward for a lot of people who who don't understand WordPress or or the back end of of how to make that work and how to upload content and everything like that. But then there's a lot of people, like you were saying that don't like to do that content part. They don't want to write the, the new text. They don't want to write the blogs. They don't want to find pictures. They don't want to do a new video every, you know, so that's where I would come in to be able to use, you know, come in and do that content for them, whether I put it up for them or if they want to do it themselves because, you know, someone like you taught them how to do it or they know how, that's fine. You know, either way it works for me. Yeah. I can help them build that content for them. Yeah, generate a, a library of kind t- content. Yeah, exactly. And that's the piece that so many out there on the web are missing. Yeah. That piece just doesn't seem to click with a lot of people, right. especially smaller businesses. They, they tend to think it's like an old school website. You just put it up there and it's got your name, address, phone number, and email, and they never get an email or anything. Well, that's because they never got up in a search result in Google and nobody right. ever saw them. Yeah. And Google likes the new. They they like fresh donuts. Yep. Yeah. Nobody likes a stale donut. Nobody likes a stale <laughs> donut, especially when it's hard as a rock. Right. Yeah. And just like, you know, just like branding – uh, you know, branding, you know, you should, businesses should update their branding every seven or so years to really stay, you know, get, you know, match the trends, you know, things change out there in the real world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that does. Um, you know, new, you know, new clients are coming in, new people are coming out of schools, different generations have different ideas. They have different thoughts. They have different feeling, you know, what they like to see is totally different than what somebody, you know, five, 10, 20 years older than they are do. Right. So, so that branding needs to change. And just like that branding needs to change. So does your website, your website can't sit you, like it was built in the you 90s. You could almost, <laughs> you could almost put a, put a fresh spin on it about every junior high and high school cycle. Fresh. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you're, you know, if you've, if you built your website, you know, back in like, you know, 2000 even, and you haven't touched it since, it should be updated. (laughs) That's probably on page number (laughs) 350,000 on a Google search result somewhere. Yeah. Um, Um, Just like your brand. If you built, if you started your business in in 2000, uh, it's probably, your brand is probably due for an update, if not a second or third update. Yeah, I would have put it at uh, the third. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Sure. 
Yeah. All right. Well, we're getting into the tail end of our, our time slot here. I, I know you've got places to go and and things to do, and I've got other things to do, too, including getting this thing edited and, and put up online. <laughs> so, um, so before we go, I do have a question. Which of the five books that I was talking about are you kind of – I'm more I'm most interested right now in the one well I, I'm very interested in the Atlantis one but that's because one of the stories that I eventually want to write myself mm -hmm. when I actually get to a re, quote unquote retirement age and can actually just take the time to really write has to do with Atlantis. I, I've been developing that idea in my head. I've, I've actually got about three stories. One's comedy, one's kind of fantasy, and then one's sci-fi based on Atlantis. Good. Awesome. Yeah. And, well, if, someday that'll happen, but not now. So the Atlantis one interests me, and then the one that was about the space pirates, mm -hmm. the, the space opera, the series. I love a good space opera. One of my favorite space operas of all time is the E. e. Doc Smith Skylark of Valeron series, which was written, I want to say, in the 50s or 60s, and I read in the 70s. And then Doc Smith also wrote the Lensman series, which has more books than the Skylark series does. And they are like, he's like the godfather of space opera. He practically invented the thing. I mean, between right. him and Edgar Rice Burroughs with the John Carter of Mars books, which were written between 1914 and 1941, as I understand it. Right. Same guy who wrote Tarzan, by the right. way. Probably yeah. a lot of, a lot of uh, influence that George Lucas took from. George, don't get me started. I mean, yeah. there's stuff on the on the Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter yeah. books right. that were taken directly into Star Wars. Right. I mean, there there was a predator in the wilds of Mars in the John Carter books that was called a Sith, for instance. There, the chiefs on Mars were called Jeds. Yeah. The kings over chiefs were called Jeddaks. There was a pit right. with this creature that would take a thousand years to digest you if you slid down into the sand pit and it got you in its mouth. There were floating boats everywhere. There was a big monster in a pit that was like a gladiator kind of situation right. in a city on Mars. And anybody that's watched the Star Wars movies is saying, I saw that, I saw that, I saw that, I heard that, I heard that. You know, what was missing from the John Carter of Mars books that was present in Star Wars was Yoda. Yoda was not at all in the John Carter of Mars books anywhere. But the other thing that's huge about the John Carter of Mars books is that the way that anyone on Mars became a chief was by how good of a swordsman they were. And we're talking actual swords because we're look at the time period the books were written. Right. You know, okay, turn it into a laser and a lightsaber. There you go. Same thing, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but in the Mar John Carter books, John Carter was an amazing swordsman, the best on Mars, simply because Martians live in one-third the gravity of Earth, and right. he had Earth strength muscles right. on Mars. Yeah. You know, so endurance, speed, and, and, and less gravity, and just... You know, I mean, it was, uh, and he was, uh, he was a cavalryman who had been trained in fencing and swordsmanship and is a military man and wound up on Mars. Right. You know, so I mean, the, the similarities go beyond similarities in yeah. some cases. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. But, exactly uh, my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it just kind of irks me. I mean, when the movie came out, people were saying it was a rip off of Star, Star Wars, Wars, and I'm like, no, it's the other way around. Other way around. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. totally. So, um, we've got about four minutes left here, and um, what I want to get to is how people can find you, how people can find me. So, first off, your books are all on Amazon. I think that would probably be the best place to start. Do you have a, a website for the books as well? Um, it's in the works. Um, I have there's a landing page for it. Um, I'm still building the back end of it, but yeah, there's a landing page. It's called it's Brian uh, B R Y A N C A R O N. 
Mm-hmm. Dot com. Uh, you can find all of my books there, and it'll lead you to. It'll have links to all the places you can buy them. Again, you can get the In the Light of the Eclipse on audio uh, at Audible or iTunes. You can get any the eBooks on Smashwords, Kindle, uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, and any other eBook retailers. Um, I think what Kobo is one. Scribd, um, you can find them yeah. on there as well. And then all the other books, yeah, the print editions are mainly on Amazon. Uh, but if you wanted to buy it from Barnes & Noble, you can go to barnesandnoble.com and buy it there uh, or go into the store and request they purchase it for you. And, and then, I'm assuming you can get it on the Nook as well. You can get it on the Nook, yes, yeah, through barnesandnoble.com. Right. Correct. And then... Uh, And my business, um, you know, in case yourself or or your near readers are looking, you know, for book covers or layout design for their books, if they want to go into the self-publishing as well, you know, I can definitely work with you on that. And you can find that. My company is called Phoenix Moire. It's the Phoenix, like their bird, P-H-O-E-N-I-X. And then Moire, which is another term for the fates uh, from Greek mythology, um, the three sisters who control your your life, uh, your oh, string of or life. Or like the Norns in the Norse mythologies, too. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that's M-O-I-R-A-I. So combine them together, phoenixmoire.com. Uh, and you'll find all of my... Uh, all of what I can do there, my portfolio and all that good stuff. Um, you can also, I don't know if you want, uh, you can email me at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at phoenixmoirai.com. It's uh, M-O-I-R-A-I, once again, just in case. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, and this is your host, Dan Stafford, with the Midwestern Geek and Cali. We're going to wrap up here. You can, of course, find Midwestern Geek and Cali at midwesterngeekandcali.com and also on Twitter, at Midwest Geek Cali. And on Facebook, uh, Facebook group Midwestern Geek and Cali, and Facebook page Midwestern Geek and Cali, and also on YouTube Midwestern Geek and Cali channel. I didn't include all of those. I should have, huh? <laughs> you should. If you, you got find, them, you can put them in you, right now. You can find you can find me on YouTube at Phoenix Moire, and uh, same thing on on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Phoenix Moire. You can find my the thing is that you can find me on Facebook for my books, uh, my per, my writer's page. Um, I just can't remember the at handle yet. <laughs> but if you look up Brian Karen, colon, filmmaker, writer, graphic designer, uh, it should come up and you can find it there. I'm blanking on the what the actual handle is for that one. Um, or you can go to Twitter and Instagram under uh, author Brian Karen. And you can find me there. Yeah. So. And any any of that stuff that you remember later, you can shoot me in an email okay. and I'll put it in the show notes on the blog at MidwesternGeekandCali.com. Okay. Perfect. okay. And uh, once again, this is your host, Dan Stafford with the Midwestern Geek and Cali. And may you never have a rogue wave in your coffee mug. And happy Vulcan fingers to you from the age of 42. Thank you for listening. And we'll catch you next time. This is episode 73, Winding Up. Visuals created using Plane 9 Visualizer. www.plane9.com That's P-L-A-N-E 9, the number, dot com. Thank you.